The Bob Murphy Show, episode 175. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. Today I'm going to be talking with David Andalfaro. He is a senior vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. He joined them in July of 2009, and he's got his PhD in economics from the University of Western Ontario. As far as his research interests, there are dynamic general equilibrium theory, macroeconomics, labor markets, and monetary theory. So just a little bit of the backstory, because I, I asked Dave in the beginning of the interview just about how did he start working for the Fed? What's that like? How does it work? That sort of thing. But then... The main thing we're going to talk about is an exchange that he and I had a while back. What had happened was when Ron Paul was running for president, the argument he would put forth and many other people, you know, adopted it saying, hey, the Fed was formed in 1913. And since then, the dollar has lost such and such percent of its purchasing power. And it's a big number. And see how that's harming the working class. And David at the time, wrote a response, a critique, saying this is misleading because wages have risen. And if you know that the Fed's going to make the dollar weaker, you can get into things like stocks and real estate. And da, da, da. So I then wrote a response to David saying, hang on, that's, that's too rosy. And then I walked through my rationale for why just because you can see what the Fed's doing ahead of time doesn't mean you can fully shield yourself from the impact of it. Okay, so that's the basic gist of the argument of the back and forth. The reason I'm having him on now talking about an exchange we had years ago is that somehow, and I don't remember the details at this point, somehow recently it came up on Twitter. And I don't know if I went and dug up that old article or somebody else did. And it was proposed like, hey, you guys should really hash this out in the Bob Murphy show, something like that. And I thought, yeah, this is a very good topic. And... I think it's more lively and it's easier to listen to, to hear people having a conversation about something rather than me just tell you guys. So then the hypothetical advocate of the Fed might say such and such, but that I disagree with because, and then they might say that instead of hearing me play ping pong with myself in my head, it'd be better, I thought, for you guys to hear me talking with somebody who really believes the other position. So I'm not just straw manning him. Because if I'm debating an opponent in my head, I always win. It's amazing. All right, so that's, and I'm, I'm partly saying this too, just so you understand how I want to run the podcast, that I, I actually like having people on with whom I disagree and yet not having a formal debate either, but just having a conversation where we can hash out this stuff. So that's how this particular episode came to be. Last bit of housekeeping is I still need to announce the Louis C.K. winners. I, I meant to do that and I, I haven't gotten around to it because of the nature of the events of January 6th in the last episode I did. So uh, I'll take care of that in a soon future episode, but I don't want to go through it all right now because I do want to talk about it and I want to just focus on the interview at this point. So without further ado, here is my discussion with David. Well, David, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. Bob, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me finally. <laughs> so... Uh, I, of course, have already formally introduced you to the listeners in the, you know, the canned introduction, but just so they get a sense of who you are, where you're coming from, can you give us a background? Like, for example, you know, did you go to work for the Federal Reserve right away or were you in academia? You know, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Just very quickly. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm um, the son of Italian immigrants uh, from Vancouver, British Columbia. I, I grew up in, you know, very kind of humble sort of typical immigrant sort of environment. I uh, spent the early part of my career uh, following my father's footsteps in the construction industry. Uh, lost my job in the great 81 
uh, recession mm-hmm. and, and, and found myself uh, with not much else to do. But I, I decided then to go back to work to uh, back to school. I'm sorry to uh, to take an economics degree to, to kind of learn what actually happened. <laughs> so when me. Paul Volcker threw you out of work, you said, I got to join him, <laughs> right? <laughs> it was a long roundabout uh, journey, but uh, I did go back to school, became interested in economics. I went on to get my PhD degree. I worked in academia for about 20 years, mainly mm-hmm. in the Canadian university system. And in 2000, and nine, I was called by uh, Chris Waller and Jim Bullard to join them at the Fed. And indeed, I did actually get to meet Paul Volcker once mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and talk to him about uh, how the roundabout way I, I, I actually arrived to be. Uh, yeah. did, <laughs> did, your, did your neck hurt looking up at him? Uh, he's, he's quite an intimidating figure. True. Yes. Yeah, it was great. Um, so, I mean, in all seriousness, so how... Are, are there, I'm trying, what I'm trying to get at is, so you were, were you a Canadian citizen when the Fed hired you or yes. did I misunderstand? Okay. Yes, and, I was. And, yes. and so is there, I'm just curious, is there any, um, how typical is that is what I'm getting at? Like where the, the Federal Reserve hires uh, foreign it's, economists. It's, quite, it's uh, you know, the the most of the Fed, you know, the, the Fed is comprised of many, each, you know, there's 12 regional Feds and the mm-hmm. Board of Governors, and they do a lot of stuff. And even, you know, any individual Fed has, you know, a, a Treasury Division, Bank and Supervision, you know, um, and, and other departments, public affairs. I, I'd say almost everybody uh, in, in those divisions are probably hired for, from the pool of American workers. I'd say the research divisions are, are a little bit different because they mirror a little bit what you see in, in American research uh, de- um, departments in the mm-hmm. country. There's The research divisions are, are much more open to for hiring foreigners. So we do mm-hmm. have a number of foreigners um, and, um, you know, they have to be vetted. And, and of course, there's all the, the security restrictions. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and now I, I am a, a dual citizen now. So mm-hmm. uh, and often many, many people do become citizens uh, uh, along the way. It is, I'm just out of curiosity, is it, do, do most people who work for the, most economists who work for the Fed, do they reside in the United States or are there people who live abroad and just, you know, send their research over the internet? Or no, whatever? no, most, most people are living just locally mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I would say all, in fact, although, okay. you know, with the, the, the current, uh, Which, uh, sure, putting aside the of... <laughs> pandemic stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, that as far as your economic views, can you give us a sense? Like, are we, are, you know, are you a Chicago school, a monetarist, you know, that sort of thing, or do you not have labels? Yeah, I, I'm actually somebody who doesn't. Uh, I don't really like those types of labels. I mean, I've always kind of said, you know, I I, I kind of prefer there are good researchers and there mm-hmm. are bad researchers. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but in terms of like these various schools of thought, uh, I think I'm I'm quite uh, agnostic. I mean, I, I love reading uh, all the different schools. I mean, I think they, you know, it's kind of like the proverbial uh, blind man and the elephant. Everybody comes mm-hmm. from the, uh, from a different perspective to. Uh, to, to basically analyze this, the same phenomenon, we're all interested in, in the same sort of ph- social phenomena, uh, and um, and each school of thought comes with a, a, a slightly different perspective that I think is useful for anybody, any academic, to to be mm. schooled in all of these schools right, of thought right. to kind of get a more holistic kind of view of of what we're studying. So I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty agnostic. I, I don't kind of label myself in, in any one of these mm. schools. Can I ask? Is it like in the United States, I, there are probably some departments that are, you know, I don't want to say non-ideological, but maybe that's what I mean. Whereas there's other, like there's freshwater versus saltwater. And, and, you know, there's, in other words, in certain, there's certain departments in the United States, at least that I'm familiar with, where clearly you know, oh, they're all about real business cycles or they're all post-Keynesians or, or what, what have you. You, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And um, so sure. is, is it like that in the Canadian uh, system as well or not really? Well, um, I don't think so, but I, I also don't think it's true in the American system, to be quite honest. Um, um, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, a, co- a former colleague of mine, uh, Steve Williamson, actually dove a little deeper into that issue. You know, well, we have the saltwater and freshwater mm-hmm. schools. Freshwater, for your listeners who don't know, are those schools that are situated around the Great Lakes. Chicago, Rochester, uh, Minneapolis, um, and the saltwater refers to the schools on the coast. Uh, you know, the, the Harvard, for example, and, um, and Berkeley on the West Coast, for example. Um, and and um, 
But if you take a look at, 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 at the Minneapolis, the you know uh, Nobu Kiyotaki is from there. I mean, he's 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 one of the uh, developers of um, Kiyotaki and um, Blanchard, for example, form the uh, crux of what's the the saltwater New Keynesian model. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, he's he's from Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, I, I know for a fact. Uh, well, I shouldn't. Uh, you know the political views there are very very liberal in, in the uh, in the freshwater schools. So it, it's kind of like you get you get the odd you know uh, Ed Prescotts who are kind of very uh, very hard edged with the real business cycle theory. Um, but I would I would interpret this more as not kind of uh, ideological so much as you know as you know hey here's kind of a view here's mm. here's here's a, a way to think about business cycles. Let's see how far we can push it. Mm -hmm. Let's see how far we can uh, take this interpretive framework to understand the real world. And you try to push it. You try to push mm -hmm. it to see how far you can go. But then you get pushed back, you get critiques, you see the flaws, and you know, and people, people back off. And they start to append the model to embed uh, more realistic assumptions, and you know the, the the theory evolves and develops. And that's that's just the way academic research works. I think from the outside, I kind of it looks more like uh, you know people are fighting and, and mm -hmm. they're they're but but I, I think it's just um, when you you know you, you get down you get in these little debates and you know you might be kind of even raising your voice with uh, your colleague or your co-author but at the end of the day you know you sit back and you think about what you learned and you go on and I think that's the way it works. Okay, um, why don't we jump right into the the thing that I think was the impetus for us to have this discussion and then yeah. you know, we can see where the conversation goes. Sure. So here I'll give a brief summary of what I think happened. And then you obviously <laughs> chime in. Um, <laughs> so it, this is a few, actually, let me pull up the article. Right? That'll help me with the, with the it was time. 2011. Line. Yes. So in two, does this thing have, yes. So you had in early 2011. Um, so, so Ron Paul had been, you know, had run for president and, uh, and had a, a big following, you know, he had done it earlier too, but you know, the, at this point, you know, the, these runs were the real big ones attracting a lot of people. And one of his mantras was end the Fed and um, something, and he had a, a book with that title. And one of the arguments he used, um, so here, I will, I'll quote from Ron Paul. And so Ron Paul wrote in his book, end the Fed, this comes from page 25. One only needs to reflect on the dramatic decline in the value of the dollar that has taken place since the Fed was established in 1913. The goods and services you could buy for a dollar in 1913 now cost nearly $21. And it, you know, it's probably higher now, but this is when he published this book. Another way to look at this is from the perspective of the purchasing power of the dollar itself. It has fallen to less than five cents of its 1913 value. We might say that the government and its banking cartel have together stolen 95 cents of every dollar as they have pursued a relentlessly inflationary policy. So I'll stop there. And why don't you, so you had written, you didn't like this, or you, you thought this was misleading <laughs> at, at, at best. So why don't you go ahead and to the listeners explain, you know, I'm sure many of my listeners, as you can guess, David, are like, yeah, get them, Ron. <laughs> and so why do you think, you know, what, what's your concerns with that kind of rhetoric? Yeah, so, you know, first of all, I mean, every, everything that he said in terms of the decline in the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar is factual. In fact, I, I believe he was drawing on data from the Federal Reserve of mm -hmm. St. Louis <laughs> data. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to quibble about um, the purchasing power of the dollar. Uh, I, I, I had a, I thought it was misleading uh, the statement that he said that you, one could one could think of the U.S. Uh, government or the Fed as, as taxing basically 95 percent of your money because the purchasing power of the dollar has fallen by whatever the figure was, 95%. And, and, and I, I was trying to point out, well, that's, that's not exactly true. Uh, it would be true for the money that you were holding in 1913, which is the year that the Fed was founded. For anybody who was holding a dollar from 1913 and tucking it under their pillow, uh, that would be true for that dollar. Mm -hmm. But of course, the amount of dollars that were in existence in 1913 are kind of there's almost nothing compared to the amount of money that there's out there today. So, if uh, if you if you think about the newly issued dollar uh, just this year, clearly it hasn't lost 95% of its value. It's, it's losing value at, a, at an inflation rate now of one you know 1.42%. Uh, uh, you know if 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 you believe the <laughs> the statistics on so. Um, so that 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 was one one criticism. I mean, because I, I felt like um, you know. Um, 
he he was making the, the statement that you know, boy, the, the federal government has, has taken 95% of your purchasing power. Uh, that, that's a bit misleading. Okay, and and specifically, so I, I get what you're saying there, but what I had for the listeners, so I wrote a response to you in April of 2011. Of course, folks, I'll link to all this stuff at, at the show notes page um, for this episode. And, and you had also said that, for example, look at what happened to wage rates, n- nominal wage rates, you know, in the same period. <sighs> So you know, so so this is is kind of um, um, you know related. So I, I, I invited the readers to um, think of the counterfactual, you know. So so um, I, and I guess this is the question we should ask. Imagine that in 1913, that the that the Fed or the Congress had mandated to the Fed that uh, the Fed was to remain on a strict gold standard and, and you know, keep the money supply essentially fixed, okay? So that, that, that would have been a possibility. I mean, Congress could have put that rule in place. And, and then we could perform the counterfactual. How would, uh, imagine that, you know, unrealistically, I suppose, but, but imagine everything else uh, unfolded as it did. Um, what do you think the nominal wages of of people today would be. So, I mean, my guess is that the inflation rate would have averaged about zero because that was the experience in the 19th century. I mean, there's price level exhibited tremendous volatility, which I hope we'll get to uh, in a moment. But over the long run, the price level was basically uh, flat. So zero inflation. And over the same period of time, of course, nominal wages grew by, you know, I can't remember now, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. And the question I have is, do you really believe that wage nominal wages would have uh, grown by that same rate in a zero inflation world. Most economic models I know of, in fact, all in fact, would argue that no, uh, the nominal wage growth would have reflected the lower inflation. And in fact, uh, nominal wage growth would have been much lower. Uh, and, and probably the real wage growth, that is the inflation adjusted wage growth, would have more or less been the, the same. I mean, we could argue it might have been a bit higher or lower, but to mm-hmm. a first approximation, it would have been the same. So, so you know, that's, 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 one, that's one counter argument to the kind of the, the inflation has, has, has uh, whittled away um, uh, purchasing power of workers. People, I think, confuse uh, a little bit what happens in the short run versus what happens over very long periods of time. Over very long period of time, nominal wages have largely, I would argue, uh, reflected this inflation. And so the real purchasing power over long periods of time uh, are probably what they would have been even in a zero inflation world. Mm -hmm. Just to give specific, I'm quoting from you and your response Mm -hmm. to Ron Paul. So you said, uh, according to, you know, publicly available data, in using CPI as the as the gauge here, CPI has increased by a factor of ten since 1948. So not since 1913, but you just were grabbing this because that's the you know easily available data. But during the same period, in other words, from 1948 to when you wrote this response, even though CPI increased by a factor of ten, nominal wage rates increased by a factor of 25. Yeah. So w- real wage rates increased two point you know, by 2.5 over, you know, from 48 to when you were writing this, I guess in 2011. And so your claim, just to make sure the listeners are getting this, is you're saying, so yes, the Fed by pumping in more dollars has raised the nominal price level, you know, bread's more expensive now than it was in 1913 or 1948. But by the same token, the average worker, his paycheck is much higher now than it was in 1913 or 1948. And so if the Fed had done what somebody like Ron Paul wanted and didn't, quote, debase the dollar, yeah, bread would still be as cheap as it was in 1913, but then the person making $100,000 a year right now would not be making $100,000 a year. They would be making, you know, kind of what's... Well, well, no, you're saying they wouldn't be making what's made in 1913. They would be making more to reflect the fact that their you know, physical real productivity has gone up and that's what drives wage rates. And correct. so somebody who, and so am I correct? Like somebody who produces the equivalent of a car per year gets paid wages that allow you to go buy a car per year, regardless correct. of what the price level is, certainly in the long run when things settle down and everybody adjusts to monetary policy. Correct. That's the claim, yeah. Okay. And then, so... Uh, an obvious response, and then folks, don't worry. We're, I'm just making sure we, you see the the original argument, what David said in response to Ron Paul, and then I'll give what my thing was at this Mises.org article that I wrote in response to David. The, so one thing that you know the the fan of Ron Paul might say to you, David, is, 
oh, okay, sure, that's wage rates, but what about people who had, you know, savings, particularly dollar-denominated savings, that, you know, that your argument, it's not that my checking account automatically increases because of, the, you know, infl in price inflation, or if I have bonds, you know, there's regular bonds, you know, that's not going to go up automatically just because the Fed's printing money. And so what do, what do you say to that? So, that, that is, um, you know, uh, and I did address that as well as right. in the column. And, and that's, I, and again, uh, I have to, you know, for your listeners, I think it is important to uh, uh, make the conceptual distinction against uh, the short run and the long run. Like a, a surprise inflation or a surprise deflation uh, is one thing, but we're talking here about sustained, predictable inflation, whether it's 10% or 0% or minus 2% for that matter. Mm. Uh, and so my response to that is, okay, um, you know, I, for example, that argument really resonates, especially for people on fixed incomes, you know, like elderly with fixed uh, social security checks, for example, that are dollar denominated. But over long periods of time, uh, you'd, ex you'd want or expect that, of course, these, these uh, social security checks are indexed to inflation so that they would regularly, uh, you know, in a, in a hypothetical world where inflation is growing at 2% more or less every year, everybody understands that cost of living is going to, and measured in dollars is going to go up by 2%, that the government will have indexed uh, social security checks by 2%. So it's true that while uh, the cost of, of groceries has gone up by 2%, uh, that your, your Social Security ch uh, check has also gone up by the same amount. In terms of, um, in terms of uh, the saver, uh, you know, I think the argument I made uh, in the column, and I, I guess I'll, I'll stand by it here, we can you know, debate it. I would argue that very few uh, people save in the form of uh, either cash currency, which is a zero interest government bond, essentially, uh, or save in the form of uh, che checking deposits at the bank. Um, you know, you, we typically hold currency or, or checking accounts, which are typically low, relatively low interest. We, we typically hold a fraction of our saving in those uh, uh, money accounts because we use those accounts. They're convenient for making purchases. But the, the the vast bulk of our savings is is not is not going to be held in these checking accounts, um, um, you know. Notwithstanding, perhaps certain segments of the population, poor poorer segments of the population, perhaps. But these are exactly the, the segments of the population who the transfer payments uh, should be indexed to inflation. For people who have some means who do save. You know, you're saving in interest-bearing securities. You're investing in the stock market. You're investing in, in securities whose nominal returns will be reflected with the inflation. Um, and, and, and we do see evidence of interest rates do rise with mm -hmm. inflation. I mean, look at the big run-up in, in interest rates in the 1970s. In the 1980, I know very well. Uh, I was in the construction sector in 1980, and I saw interest rates almost approach 20% mortgage rates. And I, mm -hmm. and you know, I saw people walking away from their homes. Savers were like, I mean, 20%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, where does that come from? So, so you know, it, it, it the the interest rates do do rise uh, with inflation in part because the Fed is actually going to be raising interest rates to combat higher inflationary pressure. But the the, the main argument is. I do not believe that the bulk of savings is in the form of low interest securities. And so that savers are by and large insulated against inflation because the nominal return on their savings wealth portfolio rises with inflation over long periods mm -hmm. of time. Okay, great. So let me paraphrase back to you what I think your response was on that point and to make sure okay. you know that, that you're agreeing that, okay, I've captured. And then sure. folks, like I said, once we've gone and set up, set the table, then I'll go ahead and present David Absolutely. with a thought experiment I did in my article just to, to push back on his defense. So, you know, we, we've talked about how real wage rates tend to be driven by marginal productivity. And, and you know, Austrian economists agree with that too. So you'd say, okay, yeah, whatever happens to the level of, of the money supply in the long run, workers tend to get paid the marginal product of their labor. And so therefore, you know, your wage rate isn't going to be, you're not going to be getting money skimmed off the top, as it were, you're going to get paid what you're producing, that sort of thing. And then in terms of even of, of assets and okay, well, what if I had such and such an assets, you're saying there's two things, I believe. One is for assets that aren't dollar denominated, you know, so you own real estate, 
or, you know, if you hold gold, for example, it's not mm -hmm. that, oh, shoot, the Fed debased the, the dollar. And so therefore my gold, you know, it got crushed. No, you, that's what causes those assets Correct. that have that have very, you know, floating prices, in fact, especially commodities and whatnot, respond, mm -hmm. you know, much more quickly than wage rates do. So, it, so on those types of assets, you know, the, the, you're in a better position as an investor or a wealth holder than even a regular worker because it might take time for you know your your paycheck to adjust, but you know your assets can can respond quickly even just on an announcement. And then I took even in terms of dollar donated stuff like a you know a corporate or government bond. So long as the inflation that's going to ensue is predictable, then you know ahead of time. So you know if you're going to give a thousand dollars to the Uncle Sam by buying a treasury you take into account, oh, if CPI has been running at 3% per year or whatever it is, 2%, you take that into account in terms of the nominal interest rate that you're, so you're getting paid back, not just for the real interest, but also to adjust for the change in, in CPI. And so right. therefore it's, you know, so what you're doing, I take it, David, is you're trying to contain the issue and say, look, it's not clearly the 95% no, debasement. That's, that's crazy. And then even with assets, it's really not fed inflation. It's unanticipated inflation really that at best yes. could be the argument right so yes. Yeah. okay yes, yes. so so here's now the my concern with that is couldn't you use all those arguments to likewise prove that just some private guy who comes up and perfects a technique in his basement with his color printer and he just starts cranking out hundred dollar bills and it, it sounds like you're saying so long as he announced to the community ahead of time, this is how many hundred dollar bills I'm going to be printing each week. And he's buying Ferraris and houses and whatever that everybody like that. No, it, actually he's not hurting anybody. He's not making the rest of the community poorer because wage rates reflect marginal productivity. And Hey, you know, if you're anyone else's assets are responding, you know, because he's telling us what his schedule of printing hundred dollar bills is. So you know, you might think looking at this guy driving around Ferraris, more, even though he doesn't work, all he does is print hundred dollar bills in his basement. You might be tempted to call him a mooch and he somehow must be siphoning wealth <laughs> from the rest of us, but he can't like read David Andalfato. He, this guy, no, he's not. We're, so we respond to that. <laughs> no. And that's, that's a very good comment. I mean, um, and the fact is, is it's it, what you said is correct. I mean, the, the, this, this hypothetical person, why, why don't we just get down to brass tacks and relabel uh, this person, the federal government? Okay. Uh, because that's that's who it is. Um, but the, the and the fact is is that in fact the, the this this mooch that you say or the federal government does extract uh, purchasing power from this process. It's called seniorage, mm -hmm. and the seniorage is, is extracted not just from printing money. By the way, so there's also bond seniorage because uh, the treasury gets to issue this. You know, treasury bills today are very very close substitutes to current interest bearing currency like reserves. So the federal government is in a unique position because it has, of course, monopoly power over the uh, legal tender. And the, the U.S. dollar and the U.S. Treasury uh, command such an important presence in world financial markets, domestic and, and world. Uh, people want to hold U.S. dollars. I have U.S. dollars in my pocket. You do probably. Why? I mean, because they're useful. They're useful for us to like uh, to buy stuff. Um, similarly, at the wholesale level, uh, corporations find holding uh, U.S. Treasury securities at low interest rates useful. They can be repoed. They can be used as collateral and quick loans. I mean, they're very, very useful in world financial markets. They're actually used as a form of wholesale currency. The federal government gets to extract uh, a tax from from this is called seniorage, uh, and so um, in fact the 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 what you call the mooch here. What's different than your example is that this counterfeiter is is doing something that's illegal, whereas you know, the federal government is is Congress. It's our our elected representatives. We actually uh, elect them, and we can we can elect them and put pressure on them to change their behavior, to change the law. But what we have in effect done is permitted them this power and to use it responsibly. They do extract some seniorage from from the ability to print money. And the question that we should ask as as uh, as, mem as as citizens is whether or not the government is using this tax money in a in a socially productive manner. Are they using it to fund public schools? Are they using it to fund uh, COVID uh, vaccine tests? Um, and 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 this seniorage is just a small part of the overall tax system. I mean, it it actually doesn't 
it, it's it's you know it's it's not insignificant, but it's also just you know the 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 government collects far more uh, purchasing power from direct taxes. Mm. So why are you complaining? I would say why are you complaining about this very small uh, part that's seniorage, when it, you know if if you were to shut down that avenue, I presume the government might increase taxes along other dimensions. You'd see your 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 personal income tax go up to to make up the difference. I mean so. You know, the, the, the question is, I, I'm not so worried about the seniorage per se. It's it, how does it fit in in the overall tax system? And the key question is not that the taxes or seniorage is being extracted. The key question is, is our government, are our representatives using this par- purchasing power wisely? And that's that's determined in the political arena. So, um Okay, so in, as far as senior ridge, like, is is a conceptual, useful way of thinking about, or intuitive way of thinking about it, that because I've seen some economists talk like this, just just look and say, oh, the the actual expense of like printing up an actual hundred dollar bill is whatever a nickel, like in terms of the the paper and the the ink, and yet it goes and buys a hundred dollars. Like, is is yeah. that one way of identifying like how senior ridge where it comes from mechanically? Right. Right. So, I mean, you can, it's like this, this uh, counterfeiter that you right. called. I mean, he can just print money. Right. I mean, and, and this money commands purchasing power. Mm-hmm. You can obviously go and buy a vehicle, a Maserati and stuff. I mean, it commands mm-hmm. purchasing power. There is a question, of course, what are the limits to seniorage? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, for example, one might ask the question, well, if the government can print money, why do they even tax? Right. I mean, and of course, there's a, a large body of economic theory explaining why there are limits to this. I mean, one one is the familiar Laffer curve. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the faster you print money, there's two effects. On the one hand, of course, you're printing more money, so you're commanding more seniorage revenue and your seniorage tax rate goes up. But on the other hand, the higher inflation that it induces causes people to economize on their demand for U.S. dollars and U.S. Treasury security, so your tax base shrinks. And so there's kind of an offsetting effect. I mean, you can start printing money at an infinite rate, but if nobody's going to accept it, I mean, you're going to extract zero seniorage, even if you're going to print money at an infinite rate. So there's there are limits to um, how much uh, seniorage revenue you can extract. And, and my my claim to you and my point in my blog was, if, if you take a look at uh, bond seniorage, it's something like five 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 percent of GDP right now. It's not it's not trivial. Uh, but the other side is note that. The paper that the government is printing, it's not like um, it's not like it's not doing anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, take a look at the global demand for U.S. Treasuries. Mm-hmm. I mean, these these objects are in hot, hot demand around the world because they're, they they facilitate and grease the wheels of the international financial system. I mean, you might like it this or not, but I mean, mm-hmm. it's true. Uh, and um, and there's a lot of regulatory demand for the U.S. Treasury as well, as you know, Dodd Frank and and uh, the Basel III kind of puts a premium on safe assets like a U.S. Treasury security. So there's there's all sorts of reasons why the private sector actually clamors for this security. And and um, so this this seniorage you could argue is a trade. Um, we're saying that I'm extracting some purchasing power from the private sector, but the private sector gets to use the government security to facilitate their transactions. It's kind of a win-win situation. It, it, so that last point you just made, would that be analogous, for example, like under a, a genuine gold standard? And, and I don't just mean like an exchange, but I mean literally like people are walking around with gold coins in their pockets, let's say, mm-hmm. and that's the money that the people who own gold mines they, they're, you know, a, a cynic might look at that, and you know, or William Jennings Bryan or something, and say, "Look at that guy's not actually working. He's just digging yellow metal out of the thing and going and getting Ferraris and houses, while the rest <laughs> of us go and produce it, and that's not fair." And so, a defender of that system would say, "Well, no, gold serves as a great international money, and so the owner of the mines, you know, that's yeah, they're they're in the production and sale of money, and that sounds weird, but that's what they do." And so they they need to be rewarded for that, and and you know, and so the likewise, like the like the Zimbabwe government had much narrower limits on how many real resources it could command by running the printing press, and that's because they didn't have a track record of providing a, a safe, safe, stable currency. So are you are you saying something kind of like that? That there's yeah. a there's a so, reason the U.S. dollar is accepted, and it's not because the re- authorities printing dollars have been so irresponsible. Uh, that's right. Uh, that's um, 
So in, 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 in the, your gold example there, sure, you said in a gold standard regime. But remember, when one says in a gold standard regime, I presume what you mean is that the uh, people through their elective representatives have decided to adopt a particular monetary standard. So this is we agree that we're going to uh, use gold as the unit of account and the legal tender and, and, and everything that comes with it. And what's something that comes with it? Well, you know that gold mine off, uh, that's owned by that rich you know, Scrooge McDuck. Mm -hmm. I mean, this person's going to be able to extract seniorage from us. That's part of the deal. Mm -hmm. You don't have to accept it as a nation. You could say, no, we could, we could create our own legal tender. But if, if you do mm -hmm. adopt uh, this gold standard and, and you, you take it part and parcel with, with the, the, where the supply comes from, and you could say, listen, this person's extracting seniorage, but at least we find this gold useful. Mm -hmm. We find it useful as a safe store of value. We find it useful as an exchange medium. And we're willing to tolerate a little bit of service fee. Let's, let's not call it seniorage or a tax. Let's call it a service fee. But of course, you know, we he better or she better be careful not to extract too much from us because otherwise we'll abandon this regime. So, yeah, and I guess it's, it's analogous. Yeah, and I guess another modern example would be like a cryptocurrency. If somebody develops something that you know sweeps the world and you know displaces Bitcoin and everything, and that person owns a bunch of it in the beginning because he or she created it. Yeah. And then ends up becoming fabulously wealthy, but that's only because through the competitive process, you know, they get a bunch of people sure. to adopt this thing. So I, you could see how free market libertarian types would say, nope, there's nothing fishy going on there. By the ways, Bob, mm -hmm. Bitcoin's an excellent example. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin uh, is a protocol that uses seniorage. It's an inflationary currency. Uh, it actually uses its senior revenue to compensate the miners for their efforts right. mm -hmm. in managing the database. So I, I find it kind of ironic that senior is built into uh, Bitcoin. Now, the, 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 the supply is, is capped, of mm -hmm. course, but nevertheless, uh, Satoshi could have uh, introduced a protocol with a, you know, the Genesis block, the original supply of Bitcoins, I think is 50. Uh, Satoshi could have introduced this monetary regime with a fixed supply of 50 uh, Bitcoins, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. he, he introduced a, a system whereby the supply of Bitcoin was scheduled to increase and the change, the new, the newly issued Bitcoin was used to pay the workers, right, the miners. Mm -hmm. So this is a classic example of using senior to finance a, a socially worthwhile endeavor. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin it provides the perfect example. Yeah, and even there, like the fact that they call them mining, like because they're not m mining, they're doing they're calculations. Accountants. Yeah, so they're it's <laughs> it's inter you know, that's obviously harking back to the gold, yes. you know, standard. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you two related points in this before we can go into the other things. So. One's more of a, a, a sort of, a, not philosophical, but a, a deep intellectual question. And then I'll get to the, the obvious difference between gold and Bitcoin and, and US dollars that my libertarian listeners are going to go crazy if I don't ask you. But the more, <laughs> the, the theoretical one is, uh, do, do you see my concern that it looked like originally you had sort of proven, no, th this can't be hurting anybody at least as long as the, as the monetary inflation is predictable because workers are always getting paid their real wages. And then even in terms of assets, so long as you as an investor know what's coming, you adjust your holdings accordingly to offset the inflation. And so you're fine. And yet, oh yeah, there's the seniorage. And then you, you know, it seems like, oh, and but empirically that's not a big deal. But yet before bringing up the seniorage stuff, one might have supposed it, it looked like, yeah, see this, this can't be hurting anybody. So my question is, is there something we were missing in the thing about real wages and investors can adjust as long as anticipated since there is this flow of real wealth to the seniorage or, or because of seniorage to the money issuing authority? So do you get what I'm asking? Like yeah. it, empirically, I, it could have been bigger. Like it just so happens that it's not that big you're arguing, but it looked like originally you had made a strong case that no, this, this is Ron Paul's just wrong. This can't be hurting anybody. And yet it turns out, oh, well, yeah, it is siphoning wealth. If that's the phrase you want to use, but it's not that big empirically. And so I'm just wondering, like, for example, suppose we had a scenario where there were just workers and there was just the money issuing authority earning seniorage. Would technically, would the workers not really in the aggregate be getting the full value of their product? Because, you know, this person over, you know, they're just making cars and this guy over here is printing dollars and that's what everyone uses to buy the cars, then if he's getting cars, it can't be that all the workers are collectively getting wages to go buy the cars they're producing because how is he getting some? So you see what I'm saying? It seems like there's something 
not quite fitting there. And I'm even personally, my, I'm not ambushing you. I'm genuinely asking, like, it does seem like something doesn't quite fit together there. So if I, if I understand what you're saying, I think, um, you know, so I wrote that blog post in 2011 in the mm -hmm. early days. I, I didn't even think people were reading my blog at that time, which yeah. is why I adopted that, uh, that tone that I wish I hadn't. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I think that in I fairness, was reading David. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if uh, you know, in fairness, I, you know, you could say that perhaps I did not uh, you know, it's a blog post and, 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 uh, it was not, uh, I was not communicating what I intended to say as clearly as I, I might otherwise have done. And, and people who, uh, you know, come and, and read this fresh, they don't know who I am. They don't know my background. They just see I'm working at the fed. They bring a lot of, um, you know, presupposition, uh, with them and, and, and might be inclined to interpret me in a particular way that, uh, and, and so there might be some, you know, there's some fault, my fault for not communicating uh, 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 as well as I might have. But I, but I hope I cleared it up here. I mean, so the, take your worker example. Again, we have to think, uh, the way I think of it is, is these workers, Americans, you and me, everybody else, we belong to a community and, and like it or not, there are faults, but we live in a, a representative democracy and we can make our feelings known to our, our, our representatives. And, and and not all of us are going to agree with the system that we have in place or the tax system we have in place. But th this is the tax system we have in place. In principle, uh, it can be amended. I mean, the Federal Reserve Act in 1913 is, is amended every once in a while, and it responds to the needs of the community. If you can muster enough political support, you could end the Fed, modify the Fed, do whatever. Um, but, you know, this senior age... Uh, you know, there's two ways to interpret it. I mean, I, I, the, the sense I got from you is, oh, we're, we're kind of like, uh, you know, giving it to the little guy. We're giving it to the worker. Uh, the, the worker is producing this car, but, you know, the government's taken away the, the seat cushions. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the worker is not uh, getting their full product for their production. Um, you know, I mean, a lot, again, is predicated on how responsible we, we believe the government is. Yes, the government is taking some of your purchasing power. It is taking some of your purchasing power. But the question is, is what is it using it for? Is it using it to build a public school? Is it using it to build a, a, a public sewage system, a public park, to, to maintain the public infrastructure, to uh, interstate highway system? Is it doing that? Or is it taking the money and siphoning it off to its friends in the Caribbean? You know, I mean, those are two different things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, so really it boils down to what is the legitimacy of, of that, that of, and not the fact that the government takes that money. I mean, could, the government's always kind of are, are, are exerting their command over us. The question is, is whether they're doing it in a, in a, in a responsible way, if they're reflecting the, the broad needs of community. So, and then as an empirical fact, I did point out in the article that the seniorage, in fact, is a very small component of the purchasing power that the government does, in fact, have. And, and so my, it's not that Ron Paul was incorrect. I just thought he was misleading. When he says stuff like the government's, you know, the purchasing power of the dollar fell by 95% over 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so you can think of it as the government took 95% of your wealth. Come on. You got to agree that that, that is grossly misleading. And that's what I was trying to push against, push back against. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I, I understand why, you know, you're bringing up the, the, the points and I guess, so my counter response just to, to address that was to say, okay, but in terms of, you know, the, yes, there's this thing, senior age, and that's certainly directly proportional to how much, how many dollars that the fed creates. So the change in CPI over a certain period is at least a, uh, a measure of the transfer, even though, as you're arguing, it's not dollar for dollar. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the, the more seniorage there is and the more of this effect, whether it's good or not, like you say, one could argue the government's doing good things with the, with the wealth it's transferring. Mm -hmm. But the, the change in the CPI is a measure of how much uh, you know, okay. So that's, yeah. that's, I think we're agreeing. And by the way, just to be clear, I wasn't a minute ago I was really more asking, like, just theoretically, like I said, it's, I'm working through it myself and I even have a paper on this stuff <laughs> where I'm trying to work it through. But you get what I'm saying? Like, on the what, like, again, just a thought experiment, you know, take the government out, just, you know, there's a money producer and there's workers. And if we think they get paid what their productivity reflects, yeah. it is weird to think through, well, wait a minute, you know, because it can't be that the workers collectively buy all the cars they make, assume there's no other inputs. I'm just simplifying. 
Yeah. You know, but but on the other hand, like, okay, so what's, you know, does marginal productivity theory break down? Like when we teach wages equal marginal product of labor, we don't say unless there's inflation, in which case, so it's something seems, you know, I don't know if it's an issue of timing or what, but it, it just, something seems a little weird to me. Like my conceptual framework actually isn't capturing everything. Well, I think that what you need is, uh, you know, I like the Austrian models a lot. They form a foundation of a lot of neoclassical theory. I mean, the way I, I would do it is, you know, I'd start with a base without the government. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and you can construct a hypothetical economy where workers are paid their marginal product and and um, everything's working fine. And then and then you introduce a government for some reason. Um, and, you know, and, and here you can make a number of hypotheses. But at some point, this government, hopefully it's an elected government, is going to need to uh, exert some command over the economy's resources. Mm -hmm. And also the state in which the economy is, is is important here. I mean, are we in a deep depression or are we at full employment where the economy is booming? You know, it kind of mm -hmm. depends. But imagine we're kind of like in an Austrian kind of uh, neoclassical full employment world. Everybody's humming along. And then suddenly, you know, we elect this government agency or perhaps it exerts itself and it wants to exert some command over our purchasing power. It, it wants an office building built. Well, how is it going to secure the labor and the materials mm -hmm. to get that office? I mean, the private sector is already employing these workers. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, the, that's the key thing. How does the government secure command over that purchasing power? How it does it is kind of secondary. The fact that it does and has the power is primary. How it does it could exert a tax. In fact, it could it could conscript the labor. Right, right. Mm -hmm. The way a lot of governments have done in the past. They would just conscript you. In fact, you know, in wars, typically, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right. you're conscripted. Right. Uh, it's a, you don't need to talk about money, finance, or inflation. They could just take you and conscript you. Or they could print some money and kind of wave it in front of your nose mm -hmm. and give you a little bit more money than the private contractors paying you, and then you come to them. It's the same thing, except mm -hmm. that they've just done it by creating money. Right. Uh, and and so, so the actual finance, I think, in my view, is kind of secondary. I mean, of course, it has knock-on effects. It might have effects on the price level that may affect the purchasing power of the money that's currently in circulation. But at the end of the day, it's the government is taking command of these resources. Question for us as citizens, do we agree with how the government is securing the, do we agree that the American government should have conscripted young men and women for conflict? You know, do we agree with that? That that's where the debate should, in my view, focus. Not so much on the inflation that ensues. Or, mm -hmm. okay, let me circle back because I had said there were two things. So the other thing I want to just get your view on, and and my longtime listeners know this, but let me say. It. When I have people on the show, folks, I'm not debating them except like if it's formally billed as that. So I'm not here debating David. We're just having a conversation. So I'm just going to raise questions and go on. It doesn't, doesn't mean I agree with everything he says. So <laughs> I just want to get your response. So an obvious objection I'm sure many listeners were thinking of, of 10 minutes ago or whatever it was. When you were saying, oh, yeah, there's, there's gold. They, you know, they would do seniorage or, or Bitcoin. And, you know, that's what the U.S. government does. They would say, well, a huge difference there is the reason we're all using the dollar, there, there was coercion that was involved, at least in the past, you know, to wean us off gold, or not us, but, you know, our ancestors. And so, um, you know, that's the difference. Well, like, with, so with Bitcoin, you know, Satoshi's not going around and forcing people to use Bitcoins. That's just voluntarily adopted. And so, you know, is that, what would you say to someone who, you know, they think, come on, David, you're missing the, the elephant in the room. Well, there, there's an element of, of truth to that. I mean, the the federal government does remain the privilege uh, uh, in a privileged position, and in, in the ultimate legal tender is the U.S. dollar. So, and that's by 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 law. And but uh, but again, I would argue that we live in a representative democracy. If you mm -hmm. don't like that law, lobby your mm -hmm. your Congress uh, uh, representative representatives in Congress and and try to change that law. That's one. The second thing is is what coercion are you talking about? I mean, I, I don't see, um, I mean, maybe there, maybe there is some law, but I mean, is there anything that prohibits me from uh, paying you in pesos? I mean, or, or gold? I mean, uh, is there anything that prohibits me from going to a shop or going to the coffee shop and paying in gold uh, or, or some foreign currency or Bitcoin? Um, 
I, I, I mean, the only thing I kind of can think of is, is when you're paying your taxes, of course, I guess the government's going to uh, ask that you pay them in the legal tender in some mm-hmm. form. Uh, but, um, but you could also, you know, dispose of your gold on the secondary market to collect the the the, 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 the fiat currency to pay your taxes. So, what what are the laws that are preventing uh, people from using pesos to buy it for stuff? I mean, if you, if you want to use a local currency or a cryptocurrency, um, you know, uh, go ahead. I'm not going to stop you from uh, paying your workers in in Bitcoin. What what, what coercion are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. So you raise a good point, and I think sometimes some libertarians ascribe too much power to like legal tender laws and things like that for the exact reason you're saying. So, so the answer, like, so two typical answers to your kind of objection, just just to, you know, for the com- purpose or sake of completeness. One is things like I've heard, like if an employer wanted to pay his workers in gold or something, you know, if if gold prices go up during the period, like he would have to pay the capital gains and things, you know. So that's that's one issue. Um, and then another one though, like probably more significant in many libertarian minds is that, yeah, maybe right now it's not that the government's pointing guns at people saying you better use us dollars, but certainly historically, like, especially under FDR, there was massive coercion involved in, you know, solidifying, like, why is it that Americans are using fiat dollars and that that was not just because oh the dollar outcompeted other forms of money the, you know the, the physical paper thing that there you know clearly I mean there were prison sentences and, and huge fines to get people mm-hmm. to turn in their monetary gold you know in on, under FDR's administration so that's so it's it's not a purely benign history as to why is it that so many people happen to use the dollar and think in terms of you know oh how much does that cost and they automatically think in terms of dollars not in ounces of gold for example. Yeah, no, I'm aware of that history too, and you know, and I, I can I, I can say everything I'm saying here, and also disagree with what FDR did. Sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, so uh, you know, I think a little bit separate. So, I, so I appreciate there is a slight element of coercion, but again, this coercion is coming from a elective re- re- representative. So, how legitimate this coercion is, I think, depends on what your view is on how legitimate our representation is right. in Congress. Right. The other thing is to note that um, it's kind of a mixture. You know, you could argue there's a bit of coercion through the law. I mean, you know, the speed limits are coercion too. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Like lobby your congressman because you don't like speed limits? Um, Maybe you could actually, but take a look. Here's some evidence that shows you that the the demand for the U.S. dollar is not uh, driven largely by coercion. Uh, is you take a look at the global demand for the mm-hmm. thing, where, there, where the, the, the local, the, the foreign laws do not in any sense uh, prescribe U.S. dollars as any, in any legal sense. And yet mm. the U.S. $100 bill is the number one export of the U.S. economy. I mean, we are exporting $100 bills like crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the, the rest of the world loves the stuff. And, and that's not coming from coercion. They're wanting it for a reason. And, the, and I think it's useful for your listeners to, th- to think about what are those reasons, and a, a lot of those reasons are why actually domestic people, uh, domestics also want to hold it. So, yeah, I want to push back a little bit. On that sure, course. yeah, right. yeah. Obviously, we're just airing the different views and let sure. the listeners decide which side they come down on. Um, it might actually be helpful. Can you talk through that a little bit just to, to un- for people to understand? So, you know, why, why is that? that and yeah, and that seems weird. Like, well, yeah, why in some country where they don't use U.S. dollars as the day-to-day, you know, they don't go to their, pay their landlords in U.S. dollars or whatever. Why is it that they would hold U.S. $100 bills, I guess, from their perspective? Is it like an inflation hedge or you know, do you want to just speak to that? Well, I, I guess, you know, the who knows what drives, uh, you know, we don't know because we can't really interview them. But, you know, their $100 bills, I mean, you can kind of figure out what a lot of it is used for. <laughs> I mean, they're bearish. Buying Bibles? Right? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, it's so... Um, so, but it's not just the physical paper bills, by the way. It's also uh, accounts with the New York Fed, mm-hmm. you know, reserve accounts, and also accounts with the U.S. Treasury. So China, for example, and Japan, each hold a, a trillion dollars of electronic interest-bearing digital dollars called U.S. Treasury securities. And yes, why? I mean, this is... Um, this is something that um, you know is, is is kind of something uh, that uh, economists are actively researching, but but it just you could ask the same question as um, I guess at the end of the day you know in some countries it boils down to the domestics in those countries trust the U.S. more than they do their domestic mm-hmm. uh, money 
and fiscal managers. So they're hedging. They might want to hold some U.S. dollars as a hedge against domestic inflation. But also a lot of you, a lot of international trade is denominated in U.S. dollars. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of benefit to uh, holding reserves of U.S. dollars, especially for countries that issue debt that's denominated in U.S. dollars. I don't agree with that practice, but they do it. Um, the Fed has recently extended swap lines to a number of countries that continues to promote that activity. I disagree with that, um, but, um, um, but you know, it does promote the use of the U.S. dollar abroad. And so, you know, you can, one way for your listeners to think about it, you know, you ask, why, why would the Chinese want to hold U.S. dollars in their pocket? Why would the Chinese want to ship over valuable goods and services to us? And what we ship to them are little pieces of paper with right. dead presidents. Pictures of our people on it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, why? Why are the Chinese willing to work so hard for these pieces of paper? Well, I invite your um, your listeners to say, why are you willing to work so hard for it? Mm-hmm. Why do you work so hard for these pieces of paper? That's the same reason people around the world are willing to work hard for it. And and so, uh, you know, we 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 value this stuff. We we value, it's a good transaction medium. It's it's a relatively safe store of value, we hope. Mm-hmm. True, there's a bit of inflation, 2% tax. You know, but that's a pretty moderate tax relative to if you take a look at historical tax rates on savings, you know, uh savings is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um and and so Presumably, these people around the world value the currency for the same reason we do. Uh, it's a useful exchange medium. It's a, a relatively safe store of value. It doesn't earn a great rate of return, but at least you know it's kind of relatively stable, and it's you know it's better than the alternative. So I mean, what are the alternatives? Is is kind of uh, what savers have to ask. Right, right. Can you speak a little bit more? Because I know a lot of people like they hear about swap lines. They're like, wh- what is that? And what does it mean to say like the Fed expanded swap lines? Yeah. So, so that's right. So, as uh, you may or may not know, so so a lot the practice around the world is is for a lot of countries. You know, private creditors, banks, for example, will will if you're in in um, I don't know some country in Europe, you might you might be able to, or some South American country, I don't know, you might be able to get your mortgage denominated in U.S. dollars. So you might be able to borrow in, in U.S. dollars. And, and, and you, you, now, you now effectively owe U.S. dollars. Um, this is troublesome, right? Because the, the workers in those countries are, are, are earning pesos. So if, if the peso suddenly depreciates in purchasing power because of some local inflation or mis- mismanagement of the economy, whatever, these, these people, who, these debtors who have dollar-denominated debt cannot repay this debt. Uh, you know, and the debt's going to have to be reno- negotiated or defaulted, whatever. And so the local government kind of has to make a, a judgment call. Uh, are these debtors getting into trouble because they, they, they made bad decisions? Should we just let them go? Uh, what are the repercussions on, on the domestic economy? Or, or, or did the peso depreciate for a shock that's kind of beyond our control that we couldn't have anticipated? If it's the latter... The, the local government might want to in, in, uh, enact in some um, lender of last resort kind of facilities. Listen, we got to give. Mm-hmm. We got to give these debtors some break. Otherwise, uh, these firms are going to go under. They're going to lay off all their workers. Their workers are going to like not be able to feed their families. They're not going to go out and be able to spend stuff. The economy is going to collapse. So we, 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 we will try to make good on, on their U.S. dollar denominated debt. Where are we going to get the U.S. dollars? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, what the Fed has done is is understanding the the role of the U.S. dollar in the in the global economy, and understanding how these bad effects that happen globally can come back and and hurt us as well. The Fed has has has, has introduced these swap lines whereby these local uh, foreign central banks can borrow the U.S. dollars in exchange for their currency, like. In, in the ECB, the European Central Bank might send euros to us, and we send them U.S. dollars. They use the U.S. dollars to kind of quell the crisis, and then when the crisis is 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 quelled, they return the dollars, and we return the euro. So that's the swap. Mm-hmm. So what 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 the Fed is essentially doing is expanding its lender of last resort uh, facilities to a number of central select number of central banks around the world. 
Can, that's can what's I, happening. Okay, because let me ask just to make sure I understand it. Um, mm. So is it, uh, is is the ECB like a, a, a good example, like a, a typical example of what you're talking about? Like, should we yes, work with yeah. that? Okay, so yes. is the idea that there's plenty of, you know, com- private, you know, commercial banks and or investment banks, but I'm saying not central banks um, in Europe or just companies, whatever, they, they have debt denominated in U.S. dollars and then... Yes. But their revenues are coming in, you know, their, their business is mostly coming in in the form of euros. And so if there's a move where the dollar strengthens against the euro, they might have trouble servicing those debts? For example, okay, or they so might the, just get into trouble, all, just even independent of exchange rate mm-hmm. movements. They owe dollar-denominated debt and they're in trouble for some reason. There's a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have to shut down. It, and they might have nothing to do with the exchange rate. But yeah, they're in trouble and can't repay the debt. The point is, is the debt is denominated in dollars. Mm-hmm. And the ECB, the European Central Bank, is, which is the, uh, you know, the central bank of the, uh, of the European community, they don't have the, the legal authority to print the dollars. <laughs> right, right. So they have to go borrow them. They either have to go to the foreign exchange uh, market. Mm-hmm. You go to the foreign exchange market, though, you're going to start moving the foreign exchange rate around. And that's going to have its own problems. So the the alternative is, can we go and ask for a loan from the Fed? And what the European Central Bank will do is, for the, it's a swap. The European Central Bank will send euros to us, and we will send them an equal value of of U.S. dollars. Okay. And then, so what I'm trying to get at is, why does the Fed need to do that? And that's because if it relied on private lenders of U.S. dollars, that would move exchange rates. And so they're trying to, to do it so it doesn't move exchange rates more than they may have already moved if that's what's causing the crisis? You know, I mean, we could have a, a nice debate about whether this is a good idea or not. Mm. Uh, but you're you're right. In an emergency situation, it's kind of one of these classic things. In emergencies, you don't really have time to think about that. You just, you know, you, you just want to uh, deal with it. And then maybe later on kind of question whether or not having these facilities in the first place is a good idea. And kind of, and then what we might do to discourage the practice mm-hmm. of U.S. dollar de- denominated debt, so the U- the Fed doesn't have to do this. Mm-hmm. But right in an emergency, you don't really have time for stuff like that. Right. It's like, it's, it's God. They need the freaking dollars. Give them the bloody dollars. The ECB is good for it. It's it's very low risk from our perspective, where we're getting euros in return. There's some exchange rate risk there. The reason, like you said, like you alluded to, why we don't let these uh, debtors go to the private market is that they would it would cause such a disruption uh, on yields and interest rates and exchange rates that would have further knock-on effects. It would just exacerbate the situation. Mm-hmm. The cleanest, quickest approach is just for the Fed to deal, quench the fire, withdraw, and reassess, and then mm-hmm. later we can debate what should be done. And is the, I know you said a minute ago, you personally are at least concerned about this. Is the, is one of the obvious concerns of this practice that there's a moral hazard where knowing that the ECB stands ready to come in and rescue them, then the private sector institutions in Europe are more likely to issue dollar denominated debt knowing, well, if it comes back to bite us, the ECB is going to bail us out. Yeah. You know, I appreciate the moral hazard arguments as much as anyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, But I, I have to admit, I mean, I, I, I sometimes struggle to see where exactly the moral hazard kind of manifests itself in terms of in a way that that hurts um, uh, people. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm just saying you can't just say, oh, moral hazard. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, of course, we shouldn't do it. Uh, we should kind of try to figure out exactly what is the moral hazard. That's one point. But more to the point, my, my view is the following is, is the one reason why I don't like it is because I, I don't, you know, I'm thinking um, the U.S. is becoming the, the world's lender of last resort. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, do people in India really want to uh, defer to the American monetary authorities? I mean, you know, why can't they look after their own affairs? Mm-hmm. I mean, do they? Do you really want to rely on a foreign government to come and save the day? I mean, I don't think that's very wise. You know, if I was living in these governments, I'm going, why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. We don't need U.S. dollars to finance the industry. We don't need, why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. And, 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 we're, and, and we, by doing it, you're actually... Um, you know, uh, as a foreign, you're, you're attaching yourself to the whims of the of a foreign government. So even apart from the moral hazard concerns that you alluded to, which I admit could be there, I'd say it's just not a good idea. 
for a, demo, for a democracy, for, for these foreign democracies, they should take control of their own destiny. And they should not issue debt denominated in a foreign currency because it, it'll, it'll just spell trouble down the road for them. Okay, so am I understanding you? It's not necessarily that you think the Fed being willing to do it is so much the issue, but you're almost concerned on the flip side. Like, why are these foreign entities, like the private ones, why are they issuing the debt in the first place? And then on top of that, are well, you questioning mixture, why right? is the because ECB? It is the, the, one way the moral hazard, like the mm-hmm. future word filters in, is the very existence and expansion of these facilities promotes the additional use of this dollar denominated. It's going to make it worse. Mm-hmm. And so it's going to make it worse in the sense that when there is a crisis around the world, the Fed is going to have to respond because all of this debt is dollar denominated. Right. And, and, and also it's not just them, but it's the Fed. Why do you want to put the Fed in this position? I mean, mm-hmm. it's, 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 not, it's not necessary. I think it's, um, yeah, so I, I think <laughs> there's okay. a number of reasons why I don't like where this is going. Okay, um, we're coming up on the time here. I'd asked you for, if you got some, let me just ask you one last one, if you don't mind. Can you just give us your thoughts on, um, like, what's the state of monetary policy among central bankers? Like, is it the kind of thing where, because like, infamously, you know, there was the thing uh, in the early, I forget what year it was, in the early 2000s of like, hey, thanks to you, you know, Milton Friedman, you know, we won't make that mistake again. And, and you know, <laughs> the business cycles have been solved or tamed. And then, you know, in, in other words, like the central bankers think, okay, we won't do that again. And then boom, <laughs> there's another huge thing. So I'm wondering like, is is the kind of thing where you, central bankers think, okay, yeah, now we, we see the new reality or is it more like, geez, you know, this, we, we, we don't understand this thing. This is way more complicated than we realize. I'm just wondering what the, what the sense is to the extent that, you know, you feel comfortable talking about. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, it's, first of all, it's, it's difficult to generalize central sure, bankers. Sure, you know, even the fed has like mm-hmm. 12 regional feds with different research divisions. There's many different views across uh, central bankers around the world as well. So it's an active area of research. I'll, I'll say one thing, uh, you know, every central bank has a research division and the research division there is there to solve puzzles and things we don't know. So, I mean, if we knew all the answers, we wouldn't have research divisions. Yeah, you'd be out of a job. So, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so. Be 1981 clearly, all over again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so some humility is in order, right? And, 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 and I think it's a good thing for leaders in general and the central banks and to, to express this humility. And I think Jay Powell has been good at that. Um and so there's still a lot, I think, uh, you know, that we don't know very well. And and, and primary of this, it's kind of embarrassing, uh, but the, it's the, the, the a theory of inflation, in fact, is it's kind of very hard to come to grips with. I mean, I, I have very kind of monetarist sort of views, but I, you know, it, it's it's kind of like for a lot of your listeners, you, you know, you, they're probably saying, oh, it's obvious. Look at Zimbabwe. You know, ha ha. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what I'm telling you. That's a good impression. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, when you, when you start, when you start, um, Delving into the uh, evidence, it just it's it's one of these things that's not so clear. But in terms of lessons learned, let me hey, hang on, can I can I just ask you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm being sure. serious. To elaborate, what, what do you mean that there are the like, if that were true, if it were just as simple as hey, you print too much money, prices go up, then how come like QE didn't cause gasoline to be twenty dollars? Yeah, yeah, is, is that what you mean? Yeah, if you take a look at the correlation between measures of inflation, and of course, I'm, I'm taking as given that we we trust the, the underlying CPI sure. and PCI mm-hmm. measures of inflation. They, they bear re- very little relationship to the size of the money supply, any measure of the money supply, uh, or, or the size of the debt, in fact. And sometimes you find those correlations in the data, like Zimbabwe, or if you go to S- South America, the correlations uh, are very clear. And you go, ah, there you go. There's some clear evidence. And you go, that's right. But then you go to a host of other countries. Look at Japan, for example. Debt to GDP ratio of uh, 200%, you know, and they have deflation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, what the heck? The Bank of Japan is printing money uh, faster than, where's the inflation? So it's it's, it's not as clear cut as what people think. So that's one thing. Uh, So that's what I meant. Sure, okay. In in terms of lessons learned, which is where I was going to go, is is I think that... um, you know, I, I, I've been at the Fed since 2009, and I saw uh, our uh, response at that time and, and also the fiscal response. You had the Obama stimulus bill. And this was a very clear financial crisis. I mean, you saw this is kind of a classic, you know, collapse in asset prices, uh, collapse in, in aggregate demand. Uh, there was no obvious real shock uh, uh, that hit the economy. Um, but... Um, 
you know, and the Fed stepped in tentatively, in my view. I mean, and and the and the tentativeness uh, uh, was expressed most markedly in late October, or November, with the Lehman. It was might have been no, November of 2009, I guess, where the Fed did not step in and said, "No, we're just going to let the private market um, handle this." And and that's of course when the proverbial, you know, what hit the fan, and 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 I mean, it looked like the global economy was just going to go down the uh, toilet, and then of course the Fed did did come in. The shock, the COVID shock, which is a very different type of shock because this is a clear, real side sectoral. You can see, I mean, where I mean, the reasons are clear why the economy's shutting down, right? I mean, it's very different from the financial crisis. But nevertheless, what you saw was a much more aggressive Fed intervention. We there was no time spent in in uh, setting up these emergency lending facilities, and indeed, even, I have to give a lot of credit to Congress, the bipartisan uh, uh, effort that went into the CARES Act, you know, to kind of uh, allocate uh, money to those people who are most affected by 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 this COVID crisis. So. I think that the, the Fed did learn that there, in a crisis like this, there's no time to like debate, mm-hmm. kind of uh, just go in and fix it. And um, and you can argue about whether or not later on, once the crisis has dissipated, whether it was a good idea or not. But from my perspective, I, I think that the Fed and the Congress um, uh, learned from the previous crisis to act much more aggressively and with much more authority. And honestly, you take a look at the economy today, where it's at, the stock market, the employment. Even though you know we're still hurting, I have a hard time imagining that we would be here today where we are without that intervention that occurred in March. It's it's kind of a hypothetical that would mm-hmm. be interesting to talk and debate about, but that's my my view. Okay, can, can I ask you one more quick one? Absolutely, Just absolutely. Yeah. With the conjunction of the two things, so I, what if you had a a wise guy listener who said, "Wait a minute." Can I use the same thing? Like you just said, the people in India, like why can't they make their own economic decisions and not be subservient to what people on the FMOC and some other country do? Likewise, isn't there, a, and, and that's why this idea of just come in when there's a crisis, have the Fed print dollars and do swap lines, and we'll we'll talk later about you know how to deal with this in the future. But right now, we got to solve the crisis. Hmm. Couldn't that wisdom? you know, be applied to this and, and say, yeah, just because there's a COVID crisis, it's not Absolutely. necessarily obvious. The Fed coming and just printing money and, you know, we'll deal with the, with the consequences later. Like we got to solve the, pr- like, well, gee, why should someone in Phoenix, you know, some guy running his business be utterly dependent on the FMOC? Like he lives or dies based on what those people, you know, he doesn't have that much direct control over who's sitting on the board. So anyway, you, you see where I'm going. I'm just curious. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's a really legitimate point to make. Um, you know, I guess one way to, to respond to that that perspective is, I, you know, I, I would argue that in fact, if you do let the private sector to its own, imagine a world without a Fed. In mm-hmm. fact, we don't even have to imagine that world. It existed before 1913. Sure. And we can ask ourselves, what did that world look like? And well, that was a very interesting world, uh, especially in the national banking era from 18, from the end of the Civil War to 1913. There was no central bank. There was no uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Um, uh, you saw, actually, uh, maybe even before, you had the so-called Suffolk banking system in New England. This is a private sector entity. What did it do? It coalesced a bunch of private banks in, in New England with the Suffolk banks at the center. And it basically acted as a private sector central bank. When a member bank got into trouble, the Suffolk bank and all of its members would coalesce and act as effectively a lender of last resort mm-hmm. and accept the troubles bank's bank notes at par. Mm-hmm. It kind of a bailing, bailing out right. that bank. It's a private sector was doing that. I mean, you take a look at the national banking era a period of very rapid growth in the United States, the westward expansion, but a period also punctuated by very severe um, uh, recessions, very violent recessions, deflation. It was generally a deflationary period as well. Um, But what did you see? You saw J.P. Morgan himself would coalesce uh, his buddies and they they would effectively... um, act as a lender of last resort. They would issue clearinghouse certificates. Uh, They would effectively 
bail out their member banks and make depositors whole. Mm -hmm. It didn't work perfectly. These It didn't stop the crises from happening. But at the end of the day, depositor losses have turned out to be relatively small. In the meantime, a lot of people lost a lot of money. Their livelihoods, you had very, very deep depressions. And it was with the panic of 1907 that finally, you know, uh, the people basically said that's enough. And what are we going to do if J.P. Morgan isn't around? Right. We're going to have to institutionalize something like what J.P. Morgan is doing, hopefully, but better. So my view is, is look, the Fed is – one way to interpret the Fed's lender last resort uh, practices is that it is adopting best practices from the private sector. Mm -hmm. This is what you would observe by a well-functioning private sector, except it's even better because we're not relying on gold here as uh, like the Bank of England had to do in, under the gold standard. And, and so you get the famous, um, you know, Bagehot principles uh, where that were designed largely to help the Bank of England economize on its gold reserve. So it didn't want to lend freely. It wanted to lend at a high penalty rate because it wanted to preserve its gold. A Fed doesn't have to do that because, I mean, the Fed can print its money costlessly and, and supply this currency elastically. And so I would argue... Yes, I understand where you're coming from, but what I would say is go back in history and what you'll see is private institutions emerge that behave very much like the lender of last resort uh, practices that you see the modern day central bank do. So the question shouldn't be, should we have a Fed or shouldn't we have a Fed? The question is, is the Fed or whatever other institution you have in uh, organizing things, are they... Are their policies designed in an intelligent manner? That's, I think that's the key mm -hmm. question to ask. Okay, great. Obviously, David, you and I could go for a, a lot <laughs> yeah. longer on this stuff, but we'll, I'll we'll stop it there because I know we, I promised you we wouldn't go too long. So, folks, my guest has been David Andalfato. Uh, David, thanks so much for your time. Bob, it's been a lot of fun talking to you. I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. Oh, I, I really appreciate it. I love reading your stuff. So it's really a great honor to be on with you and, and discuss these things with you. I appreciate that. And you're, I think you're my favorite Fed economist that I follow on Twitter. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, David. Bye-bye. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit bobmurphyshow.com.